Hey everybody. Oh my god, I'm I'm sorry. Hold on. <laughs> We're back to loud mode apparently. Doesn't have to be that boosted. Check, check. Chapter 42 is called Bloodless. The microphone's still a little too loud. It could be worse, that much is certain. Master Alwil's round face was serious as he circled me. I was hoping you would simply welt, but I should have known better with your skin. I sat on the edge of a long table, deep inside the medica. Arwil prodded my back gently as he chattered on. But, as I say, it could be worse. Two cuts, and as cuts go, you couldn't have done better. Clean, shallow, and straight. If you do as I tell you, you'll have nothing but smooth, silver scars to show the ladies how brave you are. He stopped in front of me and raised his white eyebrows enthusiastically behind the round rings of his spectacles. Eh? His expression wrung a smile from me. He turned to the young man that stood by the door. Go and fetch the next Raylar on the list. Tell them only that they are to bring what is needed to repair a straight, shallow laceration. The boy turned and left, his feet pattering away in the distance. You will provide excellent practice for one of my Raylar, Arwil said cheerfully. Your cut is a good straight one, with little chance of complication. But there is not much to you. He prodded my chest with a wrinkled finger and made a tisk noise with his tongue against his teeth. Just bones and a little wrapping. It is easier for us if we have more meat to work with. But, he shrugged, bringing his shoulders almost to his ears and back down, things are not always ideal. That is what a young physiker must learn more than anything. He looked up at me as if expecting a response. I nodded seriously. It seemed to satisfy him, and his squinting smile returned. He turned and opened a cabinet that stood against one of the walls. Give me just a moment and I will numb the burning that must be all across your back. He clinked a few bottles together as he rummaged around on its shelves. It's all right, Master Alwell, I said stoically. You can stitch me clothes the way I am. I had two scruples of Nalrot numbing me, and I knew better than to mix anesthetics if I could avoid it. He paused with one arm deep into the cabinet, and had to withdraw it to turn and look at me. Have you ever had stitches before, my boy? Yes, I said honestly. Without anything to soften the pain? I nodded again. Bring that down just a little bit. As I sat on the table, my eyes were slightly higher than his. He looked up at me skeptically. Let me see then, he said, as if he didn't quite believe me. I think I'm not connected to chat, so if, you'd, if you've said anything, you better say it again. Yeah, pretty sure I wasn't connected there. I pulled my pant leg up over my knee, <coughs> gritting my teeth as the motion tugged on my back. Eventually, I revealed a handspan worth of scar on my outer thigh above my knee from when Pike had stabbed me with his bottle glass knife back in Tarpian. Arwil looked at it closely, holding his glasses with one hand. He gave it one gentle prod with his index finger before straightening. Sloppy, he pronounced with a mild distaste. I had thought it was a rather good job. My cord broke halfway through, I said stiffly. I wasn't working under ideal circumstances. 
Arwil was silent for a while, stroking his upper lip with a finger as he watched me through half-lidded eyes. And do you enjoy this sort of thing? he asked, dubiously. Doing good, thank you. I laughed at his expression, but it was cut short when dull pain blossomed across my back. No, master, I was just taking care of myself as best I could. There was an ant on my ear. And now it's on my cheek. He continued looking at me, still stroking his lower lip. Show me where the gut broke. I pointed. It isn't the sort of thing that you forget. He gave the old scar a closer examination and prodded it again before looking up. You may be telling me the truth, he shrugged. I do not know, but I would think that if... He trailed off and peered speculatively into my eyes. Reaching up, he pulled one of the lids back. Look up, he said perfunctorily. Frowning at whatever he saw, Arwell picked up one of my hands, pressed the tip of my fingernail firmly, and watched intently for a second too. His eyes are dilated as fuck, I guarantee it. His frown deepened as he moved closer to me, took hold of my chin with one hand, opened my mouth, and smelled it. Tennyson? He asked, then answered his own question. No. Nalroot, of course. I must be getting old not to notice it sooner. It also explains why you're not bleeding all over my nice clean table. It gave me a serious look. How much? I didn't see any way of denying it. Two scruples. Arwill was silent for a while as he looked at me. After a moment, he removed his spectacles and rubbed them fiercely against his cuff. Replacing them, he looked straight at me. It is no surprise that a boy might fear a whipping enough to drug himself for it. He looked sharply at me. But why, if he was so afraid, would he remove his shirt beforehand? He frowned again. You will explain all of this to me. If you've lied to me before, admit it and all will be well. I know boys tell foolish stories sometimes. His eyes glittered behind the glass of his spectacles. But if you lie to me now, neither I nor any of mine will stitch you. I will not be lied to. He crossed his arms in front of himself. So, explain. I do not understand what is going on here. That, more than anything else, I do not like. My last resort, then, the truth. My teacher, Habenthi, taught me as much as he could about the physicer's arts, I explained. When I ended up living on the streets of Tarbian, I took care of myself. I gestured to my knee. I didn't wear my shirt today because I only have two shirts, and it has been a long time since I have had as many as that. And the Nal wrote, he asked. I sighed. I don't fit in here, sir. I'm younger than everyone, and a lot of people think I don't belong. I upset a lot of students by getting into the Arcanum so quickly, and I've managed to get on the wrong side of Master Hem. All those students, and Hem, and his friends, they're all watching me, waiting for some sign of weakness. This kid ain't read Ender's Game. I took a deep breath. I took the null route because I didn't want to faint. I needed to let them know they couldn't hurt me. I've learned that it's the best way to stay safe, to make your enemies think that you can't be hurt. It sounded ugly to say it so starkly, but it was the truth. I looked at him defiantly. There was a long silence as Arwil looked at me, his eyes narrowing slightly behind his spectacles, as if he were trying to see something inside me. He brushed his upper lip with his finger again before he began, slowly, to speak. I suppose if I were older, he said, quietly enough to be speaking to himself, I would say that you were being ridiculous, that our students are adults, not squabbling bickersome boys. He paused again, still stroking his lip absentmindedly. Then his eyes crinkled upward around the edges as he smiled at me. But I am not so old as that. Hmm. Not yet. 
not by half. Anyone who thinks boys are innocent and sweet has never been a boy himself, or has forgotten it. And anyone who thinks men aren't hurtful and cruel at times must not leave his house often. And he has certainly never been a physicker. We see the effects of cruelty more than any other. Before I could respond, he said, Close your mouth, Eler Quoth, or I will feel obligated to put some vile tonic in it. Ah, here they come. The last was said to two students entering the room. One was the same assistant who had shown me here. The other was, surprisingly, a young woman. Ah, Raylar Mola, our will enthused, all signs of our serious discussion passing lightly from his face. You have heard that your patient has two straight, clean lacerations. What have you brought to remedy this situation? Boiled linen, hook needle, gut, alcohol, and iodine, she said, crisply. She had green eyes that stood out in her pale face. What? Arwill demanded. No sympathy wax. No, Master Arwill, she responded, paling a little at his tone. And why not? She hesitated. Because I don't need it. Arwill seemed mollified. Yes, of course you don't. Very good. Did you wash before you came here? Mola nodded, and her short blonde hair bobbing with the motion of her head. Then you have wasted your time and effort, he said sternly. Think of all the germs of disease that you might have gathered in the long walk through the passageway. Walk, wash again, and we will begin. She washed with a thorough briskness at a nearby basin. Arwill helped me lay face down on the table. <clears throat> Has the patient been numbed? she asked. Though I couldn't see her face, I heard a shadow of doubt in her voice. Anesthetized, Arwell corrected. You have a good eye for detail, Mola. No, he has not. Now what would you do if Iler Quoth reassured you that he has no need for such things? He claims to have self-control like a bar of Ramston steel and will not flinch when you stitch him. Arwell's tone was serious, but I could detect a hint of amusement hiding underneath. Mola looked at me, then back to Arwill. I would tell him that he was being foolish, she said after a brief pause. And if he persisted in his claims that he needed no numbing agent? There was a longer pause from Mola. He doesn't seem to be bleeding much at all, so I would proceed. I would also make it clear to him that if he moved over much, I would tie him to the table and treat him as I saw fit for his well-being. Hmm. Arwill seemed a little surprised at her response. Yes, very good. So, quoth, do you still wish to forego an anesthetic? Thank you, I said politely. I do not need one. Very well, Mola said, as if resigning herself. First we will clean and sterilize the wound. The alcohol stung, but that was the worst of it. I tried my best to relax as Mola talked her way through the procedure. Arwill kept up a steady stream of comments and advice. I occupied my mind with other things, and tried not to twitch at the nalrut dulled jabs of the needle. She finished quickly and proceeded to bandage me with a quick efficiency I admired. As she helped me to a sitting position and wound linen around me, I wondered if all Arwill students were as well trained as this one. She was making her final knots behind me when I felt a vague, feather-like touch on my shoulder, almost in insensible through the gnaw root that numbed me. He has lovely skin, I heard her muse, presumably to Arwill. Railhar, Arwill said severely, such comments are not professional. I am disappointed by your lack of sense. I was referring to the nature of the scar he can expect to have, she rep responded scathingly. I imagine it will be little more than a pale line, provided he can avoid tearing open his wound. Hmm, Arwell said. Yes, of course. And how should he avoid that? Mola walked around to stand in front of me. Avoid motions like this, she extended her hands in front of her. Or this, she held them high over her head. Avoid over-quick motions of any kind. Running, jumping, climbing. The bandage may come off in two days. Do not get it wet. She looked away from me to Arwill. He nodded. Very good, Raylar. You are dismissed. He looked at the younger boy, who had watched mutely throughout the procedure. You may go as well, Jerry. If anyone asks, I will be in my study. Thank you. 
In a moment, Arwill and I were alone again. He stood motionless, one hand covering his mouth as I eased my way carefully into my shirt. Finally, he seemed to reach a decision. Ilir Kvoth, would you like to study here at the Medica? Very much so, Master Arwill, I said honestly. He nodded to himself, hand still held against his lips. Come back in four days. If you are clever enough to keep from tearing out your stitches, I will have you here. His eyes twinkled. <laughs> What's the motivation for that? Was he impressed by his stitching job? And why does Quoth wish to become a physiker? He's never mentioned any interest in that. Yeah, I'm doing great. Um, Jillian had the week off, which is a great boon as her program of study is extremely rigorous. Um, so one of the themes in Ender's Game, uh, for one thing, a large part of the book is about like very realistic dealings with like interpersonal relationships and and politics at this um at the place this place called battle school which is where boys learn to think strategically and and lead armies and stuff um which is like way it that makes it sound so dry because it is just like a character drama through and through um but it doesn't read like one it reads like like an action movie. I don't know how it, it's accomplished, but anyway. Um, so one of the themes in there was that <coughs> uh, if the teacher treats you like shit, everyone will like sympathize with you and like you. But if the teacher says in front of everyone like that you're better than them, and that they're shit compared to you, they're not going to like you, obviously. Um, so that's what I keep thinking of as we go through this story, um, is that Quoth keeps showing that he's above everyone, that he's better than the teachers, that he's smarter than everyone, um, that he's not hurt by being whipped. He has this a great deal of, of pride, um, and um in the real world i feel like that wouldn't work that everyone would just hate you obviously but people like him like Krevex said idk everyone goes crazy over cloth Oh man, it's a long chapter. All right, here we go. Chapter 43, The Flickering Way. Buoyed by the stimulant effects of the Nile root and feeling very little pain, I made my way to the archives. Since I was now a member of the Arcanum, I was free to explore the stacks, something I'd been waiting my whole life to do. <laughs> Better still, so long as I didn't ask for any help from the scrivs, nothing would be recorded in the archives' ledger books. That meant I could research the Kendrian and the Amir to my heart's content, and no one, not even Lauren, need ever know about my childish pursuits. That's childish in quotes. Entering the reddish light of the archives, I found both Ambrose and Fela sitting behind the entry desk. A mixed blessing, if there ever was one. Ambrose was leaning toward her, speaking in a low voice. She had the distinctly uncomfortable look of a woman who knows the futility of a polite refusal. One of his hands rested on her knee, while the other arm was draped across the back of her chair. Sorry, I just realized that I'm like... 
turning my voice into a square wave. Turned it down a little bit. While the other arm was draped across the back of her chair, his hand resting on her neck. He meant for it to look tender and affectionate, but there was a tension in her body like that of a startled deer. The truth was, he was holding her there. The same way you hold a dog by the scruff of its neck to keep it from running off. As the door thumped behind me, Fela looked up, met my eyes, then looked down and away, ashamed by her predicament. As if she'd done anything. I had seen that look too many times on the streets of Tarbian. It sparked an old anger in me. I approached the desk, making more noise than necessary. Pen and ink lay on the other end of the desk, and a piece of paper three quarters full of rewriting and crossing out. From the looks of things, Ambrose had been trying to compose a poem. I reached the edge of my desk and stood for a moment. Edge of the desk, sorry. Fela looked everywhere except at me or Ambrose. She shifted in her seat, uncomfortable, but obviously not wanting to make a scene. I cleared my throat pointedly. Ambrose looked over his shoulder, scowling. You have damnable timing, Elair. Come back later. He turned away again, dismissing me. I snorted and leaned over the desk, craning my neck to look at the sheet of paper he'd left lying there. I have damnable timing? Please, you have thirteen syllables in a line here. I tapped a finger onto the page. It's not iambic, either. I don't know if it's anything metrical at all. He turned to look at me again, his expression irritated. Mind your tongue, Elair. The day I come to you for help with poetry is the day... Is the day you have two hours to spare, I said. Two long hours, and that's just for getting started. So same can the humble thrush well know its north. I mean, I don't even know how to begin to criticize that. It, it practically mocks itself. What do you know of poetry, Ambrose said, without bothering to turn around. I know a limping verse when I hear it, I said. But this isn't even limping. A limp has a rhythm. This is more like someone falling down a set of stairs. Uneven stairs. With a midden at the bottom. It is a sprung rhythm, he said, his voice stiff and offended. I wouldn't expect you to understand. Sprung, I burst out with an incredulous laugh. I understand that if I saw a horse with a leg this badly sprung, I'd kill it out of mercy, then burn its poor corpse for fear the local dogs might gnaw on it and die. Ambrose finally turned around to face me, and in so doing, he had to take his right hand off Fela's knee. A half victory, but his other hand remained on her neck, holding her in her chair with the appearance of a casual caress. I thought you might stop by today, he said with a brittle cheerfulness. So I already checked the ledger. You're not in the lists yet. You'll have to stick with tomes or come back later, after they've updated the books. No offense, but would you mind checking again? I'm not sure I can trust the literacy of someone who tries to rhyme north with worth. No wonder you have to hold women down to get them to listen to it. Ambrose stiffened, and his arm slid off the back of the chair to fall at his side. His expression was pure venom. When you're older, Elir, you'll understand that what a man and a woman can do together. What? In the privacy of the entrance hall of the archives? I gestured around us. God's body, this isn't some brothel. And in case you hadn't noticed, she's a student, not some brass nail you've paid to bang away at. If you're going to force yourself on a woman, have the decency to do it in an alleyway. At least that way she'll feel justified screaming about it. Ambrose's face flushed furiously, and it took him a long moment to find his voice. You don't know the first thing about women. There, at least, we can agree, I said easily. In fact, that's the reason I came here today. I wanted to do some research, find a book or two on the subject. I struck the ledger with two fingers, hard. So look up my name and let me in. Ambrose flipped the book open, found the proper page, and turned the book around to face me. There, if you can find your name on that list, you are welcome to peruse the stacks at your leisure. He gave a tight smile. Otherwise, feel free to come back in a span or so. We should have things updated by then. I had the master send along a note, just in case there was any confusion about my admission to the Arcanum, I said, and drew my shirt up over my head. 
turning so he could see the broad expanse of bandages covering my back. Can you read it from there, or do I need to come closer? There was a pointed silence from Ambrose, so I lowered my shirt and turned to face Fela, ignoring him entirely. My lady Scriv, I said to her with a bow. A very slight bow, as if my back wouldn't permit a deep one. Would you be so good as to ha help me locate a book concerning women? I have been instructed by my betters to inform myself on this most subtle subject. Fela gave a faint smile and relaxed a bit. She had continued sitting stiff and uncomfortable after Ambrose had taken his hand away. I guessed that she knew Ambrose's temperament well enough to know that if she bolted away and embarrassed him, he would make her pay for it later. I don't know if we have anything like that. I would settle for a primer, I said with a smile. I have it on good report that I don't know the first thing about them, so anything would further my knowledge. Something with pictures? Ambrose spat. If our search degenerates to that level, I'll be sure to call on you, I said, without looking in his direction. I smiled at Phila. Perhaps a bestiary, I said gently. I hear they are singular creatures, much different than men. Phila's smile blossomed for some reason, and she gave a small laugh. We could have a look around, I suppose. I need more beer. I'm not cheering for either one of these people. Just going to distort my microphone in disgust. Ambrose scowled in her direction. She made a placating gesture toward him. Everyone knows he's in the Arcanum, Ambrose, she said. What's the harm of just letting him in? Ambrose gla glared at her. Why don't you run along to Tomes and play the good little fetch and carry girl, he said coldly. I can handle things out here by myself. Moving stiffly, Fella got up from the desk, gathered up the book she'd been trying to read, and headed into Tomes. As she pulled the door open, I like to think she gave me a brief look of gratitude and relief but perhaps it was only my imagination. As the door swung shut behind her, the room seemed to grow a little dimmer. I am not speaking poetically. The light truly seemed to dim. I looked at the sympathy lamps hanging around the room, wondering what was wrong. But a moment later, I felt a slow, burning sensation begin to creep across my back and realized the truth. The Nalrut was wearing off. Most powerful painkillers have serious side effects. Tennyson occasionally produces delirium or fainting. Lacilium is poisonous. Ophalum is, a highly, is highly addictive. Menka is perhaps the most powerful of all, but there are reasons they call it devil root. Nalrut was less powerful than these, but much safer. It was a mild anesthetic, a stimulant, and a va vascular constrictor, which is why I hadn't bled like a stuck pig when they whipped me. Best of all, it had no major side effects. Still, there is always a price to be paid. Once Nalrot wears off, it leaves you physically and mentally exhausted. Regardless, I had come here to see the stacks. I was now a member <clears throat> of the Arcanum, and I didn't intend to leave until I had been inside the archives. I turned back to the desk, my expression resolute. Ambrose gave me a long, calculating look before heaving a sigh. Fine, he said. How about a deal? You keep quiet about what you saw here today, and I'll bend the rules and let you in even though you aren't officially in the book. He looked a little nervous. How does that sound? I can't. I don't care about these characters. Even as he spoke, I could feel the stimulant effect from the Nalrut fading. My body felt heavy and tired. My thoughts grew sluggish and syrupy. I reached up to rub at my face with my hands and winced as the motion tugged sharply at the stitches all across my back. That'll be fine, I said thickly. Ambrose opened up one of the ledger books and sighed as he turned the pages. Since this is your first time in the archives proper, you'll have to pay the stack fee. My mouth stra tasted strangely of lemons. That was a side effect Ben had never mentioned. 
It was distracting, and after a moment I saw that Ambrose was looking up at me expectantly. What? He gave me a strange look. The stack fee. There wasn't any fee before, I said. When I was in the tomes... Ambrose looked up at me as if I were an idiot. That's because it's the stack fee. He looked back down at the ledger. Normally you paid in addition to your first term's arcanum tuition, but since you've jumped rank on us, you'll need to tend to it now. How much is it? I asked, feeling for my purse. One talent, he said, and you do have to pay before you can go in. Rules are rules. After paying for my bunk and muse, a talent was nearly all my remaining money. I was keenly aware of the fact that I needed to hoard my resources to save for next term's tuition. As soon as I couldn't pay, I would have to leave the university. Still, it was a small price to pay for something I'd dreamed about for most of my life. I pulled a talent out of my purse and handed it over. Do I need to sign in? Nothing so formal as that, Ambrose said, as he opened a drawer and pulled out a small metal disc. Stupefied from the side effects of the Nile route, it took me a moment to recognize it for what it was, a handheld synth- sympathy lamp. The stacks aren't lit, Ambrose said matter-of-factly. There's too much space in there, and it would be bad for the books in the long term. Hand lamps cost a talent and a half. I hesitated. Ambrose nodded to himself and looked thoughtful. A lot of folk end up trapped, uh, end up strapped during first term. He reached down into a lower dra- drawer and rooted lo- around for a long moment. Hand lamps are a talent and a half, and there's nothing I can do about that. He brought out a four-inch taper. But candle's just a haypenny. Haypenny for a candle was a remarkably good deal. I brought out a penny. I'll take two. This is our last one, Ambrose said quickly. He looked around nervously before pushing it into my hand. Tell you what, you can have it for free. He smiled. Just don't tell anyone. It'll be our little secret. I took the candle, more than a little surprised. Apparently, I'd frightened him with my idle threat earlier. Either that, or this rude, pompous noble's son wasn't half the bastard I'd taken him for. Yeah, he's probably all right. He's probably an okay guy. The author has gone to extreme lengths to establish that. Why did we end that section of the chapter with, maybe he's not half the bastard I had taken him for? Welcome, Quasir Rambler. Quasi Rambler. Took me way too long to parse that. Um, I'm curious about how you found the stream. Because I ain't posted that Reddit thread about the dates yet. I expect I might get one or two new unfamiliar names for that. Ambrose hurried me into the stacks as quickly as possible, leaving me no time to light my candle. When the door swung shut behind me, it was as black as the inside of a sack, with only a faint hint of reddish sympathy light coming around the edges of the door behind me. As I didn't have any matches with me, I had to resort to sympathy. Ordinarily, I could have done it quick as blinking, but my nalrud weary mind could barely muster the necessary concentration. I gritted my teeth, fixed the alar in my mind, and after a few seconds, I felt the cold leach into my muscles as I drew enough heat from my own body to bring the wick of the candles sputtering to life. Books. With no windows to let in the sunlight, The stacks were utterly dark, except for the gentle light of my candle. Stretching away into the darkness were shelf on shelf of books. More books than I could look at if I took a whole day. More books than I could read in a lifetime. The air was cool and dry. It smelled of old leather, parchment, and forgotten secrets. I wondered idly how they kept the air so fresh in a building with no windows probably magic. (laughs) Cupping a hand in front of my candle, I made my flickering way through the shelves, savoring the moment, soaking everything in. Shadows danced wildly back and forth across the ceiling as my candle's flame moved from side to side. 
The Nile route had worn off completely by this point. My back was throbbing and my thoughts were leaden, as if I had a high fever or had taken a hard blow to the back of the head. I knew I wasn't going to be up for a long bout of reading, but I still couldn't bring myself to leave so soon, not after everything I'd gone through to get here. I wandered aimlessly for perhaps a quarter hour, exploring. I discovered several small stone rooms with heavy wooden doors and tables inside. They were obviously meant as a place where small groups could meet and talk without disturbing the perfect quiet of the archives. I found stairwells leading down as well as up. The archives was six stories tall, but I hadn't known it extended underground as well. How deep did it go? How many tens of thousands of books were waiting under my feet? I can hardly describe how comforting it was in the cool, quiet dark. I was perfectly content, lost among the endless books. It made me feel safe, knowing that the answers to all my questions were here, somewhere, waiting. It was quite by accident that I found the four-plate door. It was made of a solid piece of gray stone, the same color as the surrounding walls. Its frame was eight inches wide, also gray, and also one single seamless piece of stone. The door and frame fit together so tightly that a pin couldn't slide into the crack. It had no hinges, no handle, no window or sliding panel. Its only features were four hard copper plates. They were set flush with the face of the door, which was flush with the front of the frame, which was flush with the wall surrounding it. You could run your hand from one side of the door to the next and hardly feel the lines of it at all. In spite of these notable lacks, the expanse of gray stone was undoubtedly a door. It simply was. Each copper plate had a hole in its center, and though they were not shaped in the conventional way, they were undoubtedly keyholes. The door sat still as a mountain, quiet and indifferent as the sea on a windless day. This was not a door for opening, it was a door for staying closed. In its center, beneath, between the untarnished copper plates, a word was chiseled deep into the stone. Valaritas. There were other locked doors in the university, places where dangerous things were kept, where old and forgotten secrets slept, silent and hidden, doors whose opening was forbidden, doors whose thresholds no one crossed, whose keys had been destroyed or lost, or locked away themselves for safety's sake. But they all paled in comparison to the four-plate door. I lay my palm on the cool, smooth face of the door and pushed, hoping against hope that it might swing open to my touch, but it was solid and unmoving as a gray stone. I tried to peer through the holes in the copper plates, but couldn't see anything by the light of my single candle. I wanted to get inside so badly I could taste it. It probably shows a perverse element of my personality that even though I was finally inside the archives, surrounded by endless secrets, that I was drawn to the one locked door I had found. Perhaps it is human nature to seek out hidden things. Perhaps it is simply my nature. Just then I saw the red, unwavering light of a sympathy lamp approaching through the shelves. It was the first sign I'd seen of any other students in the archives. I took a step back and waited, thinking to ask whoever was coming what was behind the door, what Balaritas meant. The red light swelled and I saw two scrivs turn a corner. They paused, then one of them bolted to where I stood and snatched my candle away, spilling hot wax on my hand in the process of extinguishing it. His expression couldn't have been more horrified if he had found me carrying a freshly severed head. What are you doing with an open flame in here? He demanded in the loudest whisper I had ever heard. He lowered his voice and waved the now extinguished candle at me. Charred body of God, what's the matter with you? I rubbed at the hot wax on the back of my head, trying to think clearly through the fog of pain and exhaustion. Of course, I thought, remembering Ambrose's smile as he pressed the candle into my hands and hurried me through the door. Our little secret, of course. I should have known.
that's why it ended that way. One of the scrivs led me out of the stacks while the other two ran to fetch Master Lauren. When we emerged into the entryway, Ambrose managed to look confused and shocked. He overacted the part, but it was convincing enough for the scriv accompanying me. What's he doing in here? We found him wandering around, the scriv explained, with a candle. What? Ambrose's expression was perfectly aghast. Well, I didn't sign him in, Ambrose said. He flipped open one of the ledger books. Look, see for yourself. Before anything else could be said, Loren stormed into the room. His normally placid expression was fierce and hard. I felt myself sweat cold, and I thought of what Tekan wrote in his Theophany. There are three things all wise men fear. The sea and storm, a night with no moon, and the anger of a gentle man. Loren towered over the entry desk. Explain, he demanded of the nearby scriv. His voice was a tight coil of fury. Micah and I saw a flickering light in the stacks, and we went to see if someone was having trouble with their lamp. We found him near the southeast stairwell with this. The scriv held up the candle. His hand shook slightly under Loren's glare. Loren turned to the desk where Ambrose sat. How did this happen, Relar? Ambrose raised his hands helplessly. He came in earlier, and I wouldn't admit him because he wasn't in the book. We bickered for a while. Fela was here for most of it. He looked at me. Eventually, I told him he'd have to leave. He must have snuck in when I went into the back room for more ink. Ambrose shrugged. Or maybe he slipped in past the desk and tomes. I stood there, stupefied. What little part of my mind wasn't let in with fatigue was preoccupied with the screaming pain across my back. That... that's not true, I looked up at Loren. He let me in. He sent Fela away, then let me in. What? Ambrose gaped at me, momentarily speechless. For all that I didn't like him, I must give him credit for a masterful performance. Why in God's name would I do that? Because I embarrassed you in front of Fela, I said. He sold me the candle, too. I shook my head, trying to clear my, I shook my head, trying to clear it. No, he gave it to me. Ambrose's expression was amazed. Look at him, he laughed. The little, little cocker is drunk or something. I was just whipped, I protested. My voice sounded shrill in my own ears. Enough, Loren shouted, looming over us like a pillar of anger. The scrivs went pale at the sound of him. Loren turned away from me and made a brief, contemptuous gesture toward the desk. Raylar Ambrose is officially re remanded for laxity in his duty. What? Ambrose's indignant tone wasn't feigned this time. Loren frowned at him, and Ambrose closed his mouth. Turning to me, he said, Ilir Kvoth is banned from the archives. He made a sweeping gesture with the flat of his hand. I tried to think of something I could say in my defense. Master, I didn't mean... Loren rounded on me. His expression, always so calm before, was filled with such a cold, terrible anger that I took a step away from him without meaning to. You mean, he said, I care nothing for your intentions, Elir Quoth, deceived or otherwise. All that matters is the reality of your actions. Your hand held the fire. Yours is the blame. That is the lesson all adults must learn. I looked down at my feet, tried desperately to think of something I could say, some proof I could offer. My leaden thoughts were still plodding along when Loren strode out of the room. I don't see why I should be punished for his stupidity, Ambrose groused to the other scrivs as I made my way numbly to the door. I made the mistake of turning around and looking at him. His expression was serious, carefully controlled. But his eyes were vastly amused, full of laughter. Honestly, boy, he said to me, I don't know what you were thinking. You'd think a member of the Arcanum would have more sense. I made my way to the mess the wheels of my thoughts turning slowly as I plodded along. Uh, when's he going to figure out that there's no stack fee? I fumbled my mental chit, uh, my meal chit into one of the dull tin trays and collected a portion of steamed pudding, a sausage, and some of the ever-present beans. 
I looked dully around the room until I spotted Simon and Minet, Minet st- sitting in their usual place at the northeast corner of the hall. I drew a fair amount of attention as I walked to the table. Understandable, as it was scarcely two hours since I'd been tied to the pennant pole and publicly lashed. I heard someone whisper, Didn't bleed when they whipped him. I was there, not one drop. It was the Nalrud, of course. It had kept me from bleeding. It had seemed like such a good idea at the time. Now it seemed petty and foolish. Ambrose would never have managed to gull me so easily if my naturally suspicious nature hadn't been fuddled. I'm sure I could have found some way to explain things to Loren if I'd had my wits about me. As I made my way to the far corner of the room, I realized the truth. I had traded away my access to the archives in exchange for a little notoriety. Still, there was nothing to do but make the best of it. If a bit of reputation was all I had to show for this debacle, I'd have to do my best to build on it. I kept my shoulders straight as I made my way across the room to Simon and Manet and set down my food. There's no such thing as a stack fee, is there? I asked quietly as I slid into my seat, trying not to grimace at the pain across my back. Sim looked at me blankly. Stack fee? Manet chortled into his bowl of beans. It's been a few years since I heard that. Back when I worked as a scriv, we'd trick the first termers into giving us a penny to use the archives. Called it a stack fee. Sim gave him a disapproving look. That's horrible. Manet held up his hands defensively in front of his face. Just a little harmless fun, Manet looked me over. Is that what your long face is for? Somebody call you for a copper? I shook my head. I wasn't going to announce that Ambrose had tricked me out of a whole talent. Guess who just got banned from the archives? I said gravely as I tore the crust off my bread and dropped it into my beans. They looked at me blankly. After a moment, Simon took the obvious guess. Um, you? I nodded and began to spoon up my beans. I wasn't really hungry, but I hoped a little food in my stomach might help shake off the sluggishness of the Nile root. Besides, it went against my nature to pass up an opportunity for a meal. You got suspended on your first day, Simmons said. That's going to make studying your Candrian folklore a whole lot harder. I sighed. You could say that. How long did the, he suspend you for? He said banned, I answered. He didn't mention a time limit. Banned? Mene looked up at me. He hasn't banned anyone in a dozen years. What'd you do, piss on a book? Some of the scrivs found me inside with a candle. Merciful Telu! Mene laid down his fork, his expression serious for the first time. Old Lore must have been furious. Furious is exactly the right word, I said. What possessed you to go in there with an open flame? Simon asked. I couldn't afford a hand lamp, lamp, I said, so the scriv at the desk gave me a candle instead. He didn't, Sim said. No scriv would... Hold on, Manet said. Was this a dark-haired fellow, well-dressed? Severe eyebrows? He made an exaggerated scowl. I nodded tiredly. Ambrose. We met yesterday. Got off on the wrong foot. He's hard to avoid, Mene said carefully, with a significant look to the people sitting around us. I noticed that more than a few were casually listening to our conversation. Someone should have warned you to keep clear of him, he added in a softer tone. God's mother, Simmon said. Of all the people you don't want to start a pissing contest with. Well, it's been started, I said. I was starting to feel a little more like myself again, less cotton-headed and weary. Either the side effects of the Nal root were fading, or my anger was slowly burning away the haze of exhaustion. He'll find out if I can piss along with the he'll find out I can piss along with the best of them. He'll wish he'd never met me, let alone meddled in my affairs. Simon looked a little nervous. You really shouldn't threaten other students, he said with a little laugh, as if trying to pass my comment off as a joke. <laughs> More softly he said, you don't understand. Ambrose is heir to a barony often, you know, heir, you know, you know what I meant. 
is he's heir to a barony off in Vintus. He hesitated, looking to Manet. Lord, how do I even start? Manet leaned forward and spoke in, in more confidential tones as well. He's not one of those nobility who dabble here for a term or two and then leave. He's been for years, climbed his way up to Raylar. He's not some seventh son either. He's the first-born heir, and his father is one of the twelve most powerful men in all of Vintus. Actually, he's sixteenth in the peerage, Sim said matter-of-factly. You've got the royal family, the prince regents, uh, Mayor Alvaron, Duchess Samista, Aculius, and Melun Laclis. He trailed off under Manet's glare. He has money, Manet said simply, and the friends that money buys. And people who want to curry favor with his father, Simon added. The point is, Manet said seriously, you don't want to cross him. Back in his first year here, one of the alchemists got on Ambrose's bad side. Ambrose bought his debt from the moneylender in Imra. When the fellow couldn't pay, they clapped him into debtor's prison. Manet tore a piece of bread in half and daubed butter onto it. By the time his family got him uh, got him out, he had lung consumption. Fellow was a, a wreck. Never came back to his studies. <laughs> and the masters just let this happen, I demanded. All perfectly legal, Manet said, still keeping his voice low. Even so, Ambrose wasn't so silly that he bought the fellow's debt himself. Manet made a dismissive gesture. He had someone else do that but he made sure everyone knew that he was responsible. And there was Tabitha, Sim said darkly. She made all that noise about how Ambrose had promised to marry her. She just disappeared. This certainly explained why Fela had been so hesitant to offend him. I made a placating gesture to Sim. I'm not threatening anyone, I said innocently, pitching my voice so anyone who was listening could easily hear. I'm just quoting one of my favorite pieces of literature, it's from the fourth act of Deonica, where Tarsus says, Upon him I will visit famine and a fire, till all around him desolation rings, and all the demons in the outer dark look on amazed and recognize that vengeance is the business of a man. There was a moment of stunned silence nearby. It spread a bit further through the mess than I'd expected. Apparently I'd underestimated the number of people who were listening. I turned my attention back to my meal and decided to let it go for now. I was tired, and I hurt, and I didn't particularly want any more trouble today. You won't need this piece of information for a while, Manet said quietly after a long period of silence, what with being banned from the archives and all. Still, I'm supposing you'd rather know. <clears throat> he cleared his throat uncomfortably. You don't have to buy a hand lamp. You just sign them out at the desk and return them when you're done. He looked at me as if anxious about what sort of reaction the information might provoke. I nodded wearily. I, I'd been right before. Ambrose wasn't half the bastard I thought he was. He was ten times the bastard. All right, okay, I'm sorry for making fun of that line. He brought it back, okay? He brought it back. All right, okay. <sighs> Friends, the writing is really good. I just don't care about this character right now. Like, I hope, like, something happens and he, like becomes a better person because right now a little character development is very needed how do people keep finding this stream like I guess they're just cruising through the like creative streams or something I don't know I'm going to make that, uh, that Reddit thread tomorrow about the dates, because that's kind of weird and interesting. The only downside is that I have to, like, go back through the book and find where they mention the dates so I can cite my sources. But, uh, maybe we'll figure it out. Hmm. Oh. 
Any loose ends I forgot to comment on? That is like the quickest come down. It hit him all at once. When the plot called for it. <laughs> The characters are the weakness of the story, but like, mm, that displeases me. <laughs> ah, well. Hey, we're like halfway through. Almost. I lost my bookmark again. What's Asoyaf? I have to admit. Like, that's the second time. Oh, okay, Song of Ice and Fire. Okay, I, n I knew it was. I knew it was Game of Thrones. That's what I guessed the first time I saw it in chat. That was a while ago. And then I forgot to look it up, like, after the stream ended. That's really weird that you would hate all the characters in ice and fire um do you mean that you like didn't like the writing of them or that you didn't or that you hated them and wanted them to to not succeed like there's there's a very big difference between the two because what i'm talking about is not liking the writing um which means that i don't care if they succeed or not which which is totally different from like an effectively written bad character like bad guy which is where you really do hate them and want them to fail um that's that's what i wanted on my bad guys you know <clears throat> who write who wrote really good bad guys like we talked about ender's game a lot today and i really liked ender's game um I'm really bad at thinking of examples. Well, anyway, it is 10. The first chapter brought us to like 920, and then the second chapter was like 40 minutes long, I swear. So we've gone over again. I keep wanting to like get to bed. Um you know, finish this up in 45 minutes, like I say in the stream description, and it never happens. Um, so I'll just use this an, as an excuse to cut stuff short if I have to, because it's really hard. It's really hard to say, okay, that's all I'm going to read tonight, even though it's like short of 945. I feel bad, but I'm, I'll know that if I choose to read another chapter, that it's going to go till 10 again. And, um, while I really enjoy doing this, I got I got stuff to do with my life besides run a stream, <laughs> which is really interesting and fun. Do not get me wrong. Um, but it's like I only have a couple of hours every day that I'm not spending on work. And uh, I've been meaning to spend more time with Jillian, you know, that sort of thing. I won't, I won't belabor the point. I'm sure you understand. Uh, all I'm saying is I'm really warming up to this idea of not feeling too bad about not making it to 945 one night. And I hope you're there with me. Okay. Yeah. See, that's, that's, I feel that. 
Even some of the most loved characters were tedious idiots who he continued to try to make you root for. Yeah, you can like feel when the author's like trying to think of stuff for them to do and it's not like working out all the time. I shouldn't criticize. I'm not an author. I'm just a musician. I'm not even a very good one. But I get the creative process. And that's all I'm going to say for tonight. Thank you for tuning in. It's cool to see some new names in the chat. Hope they stick around. And I um I will see you tomorrow. I'm not going dancing or nothing. So I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks again. Good night.